Materialism and number theory. It may seem a bit odd that I'm giving a talk on number theory. But the struggle between materialism and idealism occurs in the most diverse areas. And idealist mathematical theories are actually mobilised by neoliberals to attempt to refute the possibility of socialist planning. So I'm going to run through what is wrong with the idealist theory of numbers. And on a later video, I may go into the attacks that neo neoliberals have made using idealist number theory. In a previous talk, I presented the Nunes theory, which is a very materialist theory, that we can conceptualise infinity only because our nervous system has the ability to perform unbounded repetition, particularly when we are walking or running. We repeatedly do the same thing with our legs. And more generally, all maths is only possible because there are certain innate abilities in the real nervous system that become augmented later on by the use of physical tools like blackboards, calculators, computers, etc. Now, we talk about steps. Steps when we're walking and steps when we do mathematical procedures. And our ability to think of them rests on the pre-given ability of the brain to generate impulses that result in physical steps sequences of limb movements and that's true whether we're walking or writing down sums as a child in school we learn procedures sequences of steps for multiplication and division and these are movements of the forelimbs grasping pencils the learning of maths is tied up with spatiomotor skills now the idea of infinity is an abstraction form by simply imagining that we can go on with this process of adding up that we learned in school indefinitely, step after step. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, etc. Going on indefinitely. But the real world isn't like that. Neither we nor rodents can run forever. If we keep on running, we'll run into the sea. Keep adding one and you'll run out of paper in your jotter. The point is that everything in the material world is finite and material reality is all that exists, unlike the idealist position, which is that numbers have an ideal reality outside of material reality. Now, this is a debate which goes back right back to the ancient Greeks. The proto-materialist philosopher Aristotle held that there was no such thing as an actual infinity. He said, it's plain from these arguments that there is no body that can actually be infinite. And there he's talking about material bodies. No material body can be of infinite size. Infinity, he said, referred to the potential for a mathematical process to continue indefinitely. I'm quoting Aristotle here. Clearly, there is a sense in which the infinite exists and another in which it does not. We must keep in mind that the word is means either what potentially is or what fully is. Further, a thing is infinite either by addition or by division. Now, as we have seen, magnitude is not actually infinite, but in division it is infinite. The alternative then remains that the infinite has a potential existence. Now this was absolutely accepted by mathematicians from the philosopher Aristotle on until the 19th century. Now we now know that his point about division is wrong. He believed there was nothing could be infinitely large but in principle you could divide length into infinitely small units. Now we know that's wrong and I may explain the physics of that at a later date. All that we really say about infinity is that there's potentially no highest number. 
We've got a symbol infinity, but it doesn't designate a number or a magnitude. But the idea that addition is potentially unbounded goes from a series of axioms. One's a number. If n's a number, so is n plus 1. Thus, there should be no number m greater than all other numbers. This is what um, Aristotle means when he says we've seen magnitude is not actually infinite, only potentially. In actuality, there always is a, a highest number. The point I made about running out of space in your jota. If you try adding one to this very large number, 92233720368. Seven seven five eight zero seven on a contemporary computer, you will not get what you expect, but you'll get a minus number minus nine two 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 two, ending eight zero eight, and that's because the computers work with sixty four bit numbers, and you can't go any higher. To compute arbitrarily large numbers, as implied by the ability to add one to numbers indefinitely. You need something else. You need the Turing machine. It is a, a computer designed by or proposed by Turing in the 1930s as a way of doing arbitrary precision arithmetic. And numbers are stored in binary on tapes which are of arbitrary unbounded length rather than fixed size registers. Now, obviously, it's going to be very slow because you can physically move tape along. And it's also going to be slow because it does bit serial arithmetic rather than parallel arithmetic. But it's there to show the potential of doing arbitrary precision arithmetic. And it's an important point to note is that Turing says the tape is unbounded. Not that it's infinite. It's an unbounded tape. So Turing is taking an Aristotelian position here. This is Turing's 1936 paper. Um, and this is a very important point about what numbers are. According to my definition, a number is computable if its decimal can be written down by a machine. Now that seems straightforward to us now, but it was a breakthrough when he first proposed it. So what does he say these computable numbers are? Before Turing, the class of computable numbers was not talked about. Mathematics had already classified numbers into a variety of classes. The natural numbers, one, two, three, four, etc., going upwards. The rational numbers formed by ratios or divisions of uh, natural ones, one upon one, one upon two, one upon three, two upon three, etc. The rational numbers, when we say they're rational, it doesn't just mean that, it just means they're ratios. It doesn't mean they're to do with reason. The so-called real numbers, like root 2, for example, and the imaginary numbers, like uh, the square root of minus 1. Now, let's see how these map on to the Turing computable numbers. For natural numbers, a program that just has a print statement will compute them. So, the natural number 307 is computed by a program that says print 307. For rationals, you have a division instruction followed by the two numbers. So the rational number two-thirds would be encoded as div two three, and it would turn out to be a circular, or what um, what we now call a looping program, but what uh, Turing called a circular program, um, and it. The, the term div would be an actual subroutine and it would print out 0 0.6666 indefinitely. For real numbers, 
you would have specifically tailored programs. You'd have a specific square root program to co compute uh, square roots, a cube root program, etc. We're familiar with that. A program to compute pi. Th this is all straightforward nowadays because that's how computers work. And similarly for the real parts of imaginary numbers. Now note that in the Turing um, picture, there's nothing very specific about rational numbers. They had been the distinction between reals and rationals had been crucial in ancient Greek maths, but from Turing's point of view, the only difference is the specific subroutine you use to calculate them. You use a division subroutine in one case and square root subroutine in another. And actual computers make no provision for rational numbers. Now there's something else Turing said. Although the class of computer numbers is so great and in many ways similar to the class of real numbers, it is nevertheless innumerable. Okay, now I'm passing from Turing, who is a materialist, to the idealist background of his work. Why does he say this? What does it mean and why is it important? Now, innumerable. This just means that we can count up the computable numbers. We can associate an integer with every computable numbers. How? It's quite simple, according to Turing. The programs which print out the computer number, computable numbers are themselves just a finite sequence of bits. And any long sequence of bits is itself just a binary number. So here we have uh, a universal Turing two-tape machine um, with a, an input tape and an output tape. The input program goes in there with a series of zeros and ones. That can be treated as a number and the computed number gets printed out there. So the generating programs are themselves the enumeration of the computable numbers. Now why is this important? Now we have to touch on the idealist school. When Turing wrote the class of real numbers, he was referring to the concept of real numbers put forward by the devoutly Christian Lutheran mathematician Cantor, who'd worked in the late 19th century. From the 4th century BC until the 19th century, mathematicians had accepted Aristotle's argument against actual infinity and accepted that the term just refers to potential unboundedness of numbers or subdivision. Christian theology, on the other hand, held that God was the perfect, complete, actual infinity. Cantor's great achievement was to construct an argument that he attributed to divine revelation. He claimed it came to a dream from God, um, whereby this theological concept could be introduced into maths curriculum. Real Numbers 101. Students learned that the Greeks found out that there were problems in geometry that implied the existence of numbers that couldn't be expressed as the ratio of two integers. The most famous example is root 2, which arises if you diagonally cut across a square. So let's assume the original sides of the square were 1 and 1. Diagonally cut across, what's the length of the hypotenuse? Well, by Pythagoras' theorem, the area on the hypotenuse is 2. Therefore, the length of the hypotenuse has to be root 2. So, root 2 must be a real number, must really exist. But Euclid was able to demonstrate that it was an irrational number. No ratio of two numbers could lead to it. So, there were numbers that were real but irrational. Now... After that, students will be introduced to Cantor's theory, according to which numbers fall into classes. The class of real numbers is the biggest. Within that, you get the rational numbers as a subset, and within those, you get the natural numbers as a subset. And how does this compare to Turing's scheme? Well, it looks pretty similar. Natural numbers, rationals, the classical reals all went into the computable reals. 
The difference is that Turing is saying he's explicitly concerned with numbers computable by finite means and that his set is innumerable, whereas Cantor claimed that his set was non-innumerable, that it, there were more than an infinite number of reals. What does he call his, his real numbers? Infinitely long decimal numbers. Now this seems a harmless extension, since we already knew that things like pi and root 2 have non-repeating decimal expansions. And obviously a rational number can also be written down to an arbitrary decimal precision, as can an integer. So, is this valid? No, it's not. It's a slate of hand. There's a surreptitious shift of meaning. I'm now going to come all hard line. Where do correct ideas come from? Do they drop from the sky? No, they don't. Are they innate in the mind? No, they're not. They come from social practice and from it alone. And they come from the practice of product, struggle for production, class struggle and the scientific experiment. And this applies to maths as well. The correct idea of real numbers came from the actual practice of geometry. Pi and root 2 were discovered. The actual practice of mathematicians later gave a means by which their decimal value could be computed to arbitrary precision. Their reality had been demonstrated in practice. So, if we take the Turing computable numbers away from Cantor's real numbers, what's left? You're only left with numbers that could never be computed. Numbers that no mathematician could even rationally imagine. Numbers that could at best be known only to the infinite gods. The Olympian numbers. Numbers known to Zeus. Cantor wants to go beyond the computational event horizon. He's laying claim to not only all numbers that could be discovered or computed, but ones whose computation no algorithm could in principle exist for. Now, he wouldn't have been able to achieve his pious task, for which he corresponded with the Pope, had he not been able to introduce religious mysticism into maths by some means of an argument that was at least plausible. And this was his diagonal argument. Here he is presenting his diagonal argument. Start out by assuming that the reals are innumerable. Write them all down on lines, one below the other. Numbering the lines. So that's fair enough if they're innumerable. Now going diagonally from the top left corner, change one digit on each line. You can do it by any means you want, so long as you change it. Read off the new number on the diagonal, and because it differs by one digit from every other number, it must be a new number, hence the reals must be uh, non-innumerable. They must be transfinite. So here's an illustration, a table of numbers. How do we apply the Cantor procedure? Well, look at the, the first two numbers on the diagonal. Six, well, look, the first three. Six, two, three. We change them to seven, three, four, and do the same all the way down. And you end up with a new number, seven, three, four, nine, two, one, five, zero, six, eight, three, which differs from all the numbers you had before. Now, that seems a fair enough thing. I've only shown the first 12 digits of every number and 12 rows. But, and Cantor's assuming infinitely long numbers with infinitely many rows, but the argument seems valid. What's wrong with it? Well, his argument is explicitly procedural. With steps, form the infinite decimal expansions, put them in a list with numbers, then go step by step along the diagonal. Now, as a procedure, this is incoherent. You're obviously never going to terminate while forming your first infinitely long decimal expansion. So the algorithm has got a bug in it. And also, you've got no procedure for forming the infinite decimal expansion of the Olympian numbers. You can never write them down. He's in effect assuming completed infinities are given to him by Zeus, by some divine miracle. But even if Zeus intervenes and gives him the numbers, is it valid? Well, I'm going to give a counter-argument. Um, 
The counter-argument is originally presented in our book Computation and Its Limits and was independently discovered by Katani four years later in a paper in Open Journal of Philosophy. In both presentations, we shift from doing, using decimal numbers to binary fractions in the range 0 to, to 1. This simplifies things because digit along alteration along the diagonal becomes just Boolean not. And this is a valid extension because an argument about numbers doesn't depend on whether you write them down as decimals or binary. And according to Cantor, the number of reals in any subrange of the reals is also non-enumerable. So if we can demonstrate that the range 0 to 1 is enumerable, we've demolished this proof. And why are we using binary? Well, as I say, changing the digits becomes simple. And you can also illustrate the whole thing in a lecture with very simple tables. What are the binary fractions? Well, there are two one-bit binary fractions, 0 and 0 0.1, which mean 0 and a half. There are four two-bit binary fractions. 0, 0 is 0, 0, 1 is a quarter, 1, 0 is a half. 1-1 one, one is 3 quarters, etc. The extension to longer binary fractions should be obvious. Now the counter-argument is to show that as we construct successive bits of the binary of the diagonal number, there will never exist a stage at which the prefix of the binary fraction so far constructed doesn't already exist in our table. So his argument must be false. It's obvious in the first case, OK? We toggle bit 0 and we get 1, which was already in the table. Now, next stage, we extend our table. We extend it by adding trailing zeros to the numbers we've already got. We then take the entire table and toggle the last bits to form a table of twice the length. So we've toggled 0, 0, the last bit becomes 0, 1. We toggle the last bit of 1, 0, and it becomes 1, 1. So we've now got a table of twice the size, and obviously you can do this as a generalized method. We then apply the diagonal method. The diagonal method now gives us, again, 0 0.11, which was in the table again. So, Cantor's method is not working, and however many bits be in the diagonal number, we consider there will always be a number with the same b-bit prefix in our list, which will always, because the list always contains all the 2 to the b possible prefixes. So the diagonal procedure can never do what Cantor claims it does. Uh, the particular way I'm constructing it always gives you 1111 along the diagonal. You could construct the table in different manners, which would give you different diagonal numbers. But it, he doesn't... The important point is Cantor made no specific assumptions about the order of the reals. He's saying there could be no ordering of the reals, which was innumerable. Well, we just demonstrate there is an ordering of the infinite binary fractions, which is enumerable. And since the infinite binary fractions map onto the range 0 to 1, which is part of the reals, Cantor's proof falls. Why bother with all this? Well, first reason is you need to understand the intellectual context in which great materialist advances were made. I took, in a previous lecture, the example of Einstein's Nobel Prize winning paper on Brownian motion and argued that that was, in fact, an implicit polemic in favour of Boltzmann against the idealist Mach. And the paper by Turing is an implicit polemic against the idealist Cantor. 
Second reason is there have been attempts by neoliberal economists to use Cantor's arguments to prove the impossibility of economic planning. If you're interested, the paper listed here demolishes those arguments.